We're going to be talking today on students' perspectives on AI. So we have with us um, uh, Ali Fori um, Fourier, Fourier. I, we worked on that. <laughs> uh, Fourier, uh, Danielle Harms, uh, David Kosick, uh, and Benjamin Gouch, who are each going to share with you um, their perspectives and as well as the other students on campus as well uh, concerning AI, how students are using it. Uh, and just kind of what their thoughts are regarding it. So we're going to start off with Ali. Ali, thank you so much. So oh, thank you for having me. I'm Ali Boyer. I am here as an undergraduate student studying psychology and interpreting. And I only started using AI last spring when I was in Blaine's class. So I'm pretty new but my uncle is a computer science professor at MSOE, and my cousin's getting his master's here in artificial intelligence design. So I've had some discussions about, about holidays and AI, and <laughs> so much fun when you don't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> but I have used some AI, I like to use it for proofreading papers and just making sure citations are correct. I find that when it reads it to me, I can find mistakes easier. And some of those tools are just really helpful, especially in Word and ChatGPT. I also have a lot of creative projects to do. And when I can't think of a topic or I can't think of a title, I use AI just to give me ideas and brainstorm. Um, I found it's not always accurate, which is why I don't use it for, say, help you write an email or give me sources. But I've also found that it's super helpful for creative topics such as figuring out an idea on where to start, um, discussing with family who does design AI and uses it quite often. There's some pros and cons. It's not always accurate. It's definitely one. But I've also heard that it, there's a potential for it to take what you've written and it now becomes public domain if you put it in. And that's definitely a concern. But it's also, I found it very helpful for proofreading. Excellent. Thank you very much, Allie. And we'll have some questions as well at the at, at the end. Yeah, at the end as well. So feel free. Yes. Uh, so up next uh, will be uh, Danielle Harms. Thank you. Okay. And she'll be joining us online. Hear? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So my name is Danielle Harms. I am a dissertator in the PhD program focusing on creative writing. So I am in um, my fifth year. Um, so. Um, I'm writing my dissertation, which is a work of creative, uh, it's a creative work, it's a creative manuscript with a scholarly introduction, so it's fiction. And I felt like um, my my partner also works in technology. Um, oop, sorry, I realized I have the top of the computer. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, my partner works in technology. So of course, like everybody else, like conversations around generative AI, were sort of percolating around me as I came into the fall semester. But I wanted to share just like three ways that I felt like it kind of became more present in my life. So um, I'm in a writing group of people that I did my MFA with, and we live across the country. And so we meet online, and all of us are trying to write novels and get our first novels published. And um, one of my writing group members, um, had shared a draft of his novel and he also works for Amazon Web Services. So he was aware of this um, generative AI tool called Claude.ai, C-L-A-U-D-E. Um, and his novel is great and we've read many drafts. And yet I was struggling to comment on, to give feedback because I was very disoriented about what was happening. <laughs> and he kind of sent an email. He said like, I was sort of playing around with this AI model, I asked it to generate some synopses back to me of my work. So uh, he copy and paste into the email this, um, yeah, thank you, Lane, this interesting synopsis. And at first I had skimmed past, you know, I, I'm like a bad email reader. So I was just reading the bullet points, which was generated by AI, but I hadn't actually read the email yet. And all of a sudden I was like, just reading the synopsis, which was AI generated. And it was so helpful to me because all of a sudden I could see what I was missing. <laughs> I saw what he was trying to achieve and all, and I had better feedback to give. 
And I was like, thank you, Jay. I didn't even know you had this clarity. And then I slowed down and went back and read the email and realized that the content that I was looking that I was appreciating had been generated in, in connection with an AI generative AI bot. Um, so it was really interesting and it did feel like in this tight little writing group, there was an additional presence who was kind of offering an aid. And yet some people in that writing group were like, I'm not even gonna look at that. I don't wanna see it. Um, so it was just an interesting collision. And at the same time, I had been at the Breadloaf Writing Conference, which is a large writers conference that happens in Vermont. And there's tons of novelists and poets and published authors who make their life publishing their work. And people were really concerned um, about the ways that their work was being taken up by AI. And directly after that conference, an Atlantic article came out um, that kind of revealed a data set, Books 3, a database that had been used to coach an AI tool. And many of the people at that conference found that their work was used to coach an AI tool um, so you could say, like, write me an essay in the style of Melissa Phoebos someday, um, and it might generate prose in that style. And yet they had not been, um, they weren't aware and they hadn't been compensated. And there was just a lot of, like, anger and fear and consternation. And so at that time, I'll put the link to that article. Um, it's a little bit fear mongery, but I don't think I'm in, not without <laughs> some some good context. Um, but at that time, there was like a database that you could search to see if your work had been used in uh, um, in this like data set. And it was interesting to me how many of the people, some of them big, big authors you might know, and others like people who were published in small lit mags um, and really weren't compensated for that work or maybe even paid in some ways to have it published um, were in that data set. So that was interesting. And then I also study writing pedagogy. So I was preparing my classes. Um, and so one of the things that I did is I had this idea that I had created like an AI proof assignment because it had multiple steps. It was very personal narrative based. It was like a reading process report. Um, it asked for like tons of metacognition. Um, and I also had this idea, which I, I now realize was totally false, that I had that I was the head of my students, of my undergraduate students um, in that I knew more than they did about AI. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, totally, I don't know what gave me that idea. I never know more than they do. I'm like we share the same media ethos. So um, our ecosystem. So one thing I found after that project, just out of curiosity, I'd been playing around with this cloud AI. And so I spit in my assignment directions, which are super long, like way over the top. Um, and it gave me a first person reflection that like was excellent. I mean, it wasn't like I could, it was a little generic, but it absolutely would have gotten a B or A in the class. Um, and so I wasn't scared of that, but I was, it was a wake up call in how I was teaching. And I realized I wanted to be engaging with this tool, just like I was, like I teach writing as a process. I believe in that pedagogy and I study that pedagogy. And so it really made me start to think about like, if that is my conviction, um, how would I do that? So one thing that I did in classes for the second paper, which I also thought was AI proof and was wrong, I created an AI, like I did it, I created an AI generated paper. And then um, we kind of commented on it using hypothesis as a draft. Um, and then after the students had commented on this hypothetical student's work as a draft and gave feedback about what they might suggest the student do to improve or develop or deepen the critical inquiry, um, I revealed I didn't really mean it to be a dramatic reveal, but it sort of was <laughs> that the thing that they had been commenting on was all generated by AI in the first place and that there was no student um, who had created no individual student. And so it actually was a really productive and fruitful conversation. Like I'm trying to figure this out as a student myself. Like I know the questions I'm interested in about AI, like I'm interested in the way it takes up the biases of its data set. I'm interested in the way it like uh, replicates um uh, discriminatory practices or discriminatory ideas um i'm also interested in its creative possibilities but i don't have a lot of answers and so i felt like as both a student and a ta who teaches english classes that was a pretty fruitful position to come to, to be in and to talk to my students about and so we did talk about how like um the paper that we commented on was fine but it was kind of uninteresting there didn't seem a lot to be a lot of genuine learning um, and it was a good conversation, but in my own work, I've also kind of 
use it to kind of complement, like basically to stress test my literature reviews for things I'm doing in my own research. I, I study like miscarriage and literature. And um, I had this funny thing happen where it, I was trying, I think I was asking you to comment on a literature review and I was trying to suss out and ask if it, if I was missing any sources or something like that. It's kind of a silly thing because like I know that I've read the sources, but I still thought, well, maybe this is a possibility for this tool. Um, and on the one hand, it kind of was like affirming and clarifying the kind of feedback it gave about like what sources are important on this or whatever. Um, but on the other hand, it sort of very confidently started giving me um, like some like MLA citations of other sources that I was not familiar with. Some that were like dream sources, like exactly what I was looking for. And, you know, even I, as a PhD student, who I think is like pretty decent at library database research, I spent like 15 minutes searching around thinking like, this must exist somewhere. I've just got to get the right interlibrary loan or whatever. Well, I mean, like, as you probably might have already sussed out, it was it, that the sources it was suggesting to me did not exist. So it, I, I guess this is called hallucinating, though I don't know if it's exactly right in this topic. It was giving me the name of, you know, it uses predictive patterns. So it was giving me the name of a source that sounded totally valid, uh, but isn't real. And so the thing that was very interesting to me is once I had figured out this wasn't a real source, it's a chat dialogue. So I came back and I said, is this a real source? And the AI bot apologized to me and said, I'm very sorry. That was a fabricated <laughs> example of an academic source that could exist, but doesn't. But here are the ones that were real. So I also then like, now that I knew this could happen, I sort of played with it to make it do that again um, in a way that I could share with my students. And I asked it to plan, like a, help me plan a trip to Door County. Um, and my family likes to cut down a, a Christmas tree in Door County. And, but once again, I was sort of tricked because I was like looking for this and trying to make it happen. And yet it gave me a list of Christmas tree farms. And it told me about this one great Christmas tree farm in a very convenient location that had hours and like the kinds of trees and the Fraser fir varieties and things like that. Um, and then when I could not find it on the internet, <laughs> I looked around quite a while. And it's because <laughs> once again, like this Christmas tree farm does not exist, but it is exactly what I wanted. And so like through my responses, it had delivered that to me. And then I had to do the fact checking in a very practical way to figure out like on Sunday, I should not at 11 a.m. show up at this intersection because there's no Christmas tree to be had there. Um, so that was, and, and it's interesting to me, the language, like once again, um, it like came back to me and said, actually, that was a fabricated example. So this language of fabricated example has appeared a couple of times, which is interesting to me. Um, but it, it was only like once I prompted it to tell me that. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. It's I don't really have a lot of answers, except for I think it's been interesting inquiries. And I think it's going to define probably my life as a teacher and a writer. <laughs> and I'm not sure what, how, what that will all look like, um, but I'm trying to pay attention. Thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, up next is uh, David Kosick. So, David. Great. I'm just going to sit. Sure. Um, I just like being informal. Um, so when it comes to, so I, I come at like the conversation about AI kind of at three different angles. I'm a graduate student, a fourth year PhD student in the English department in media, cinema, and digital studies. I'm drafting my dissertation right now. Um, I'm in that process. I'm also, um, my undergraduate degree was in English teaching and I'm an English educator. Like I teach in the writing program here um, at, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, so like, I also think about it in terms of like the teacher perspective. Um, and I also do curriculum development with AI with the English department. Um, so I'm kind of like approaching it from all three things. I think the first thing, the, the kind of way I got into the AI thing was um, through actually like revision tools. So um, things like Grammarly, I've had Grammarly for a long time um, on my computer ever since I started working on my master's thesis. So that's such a large project you can only work on basically in you know one semester. I was like, I kind of want a more sophisticated you know writing helping tool. Um, that was in 2020. So that was kind of a little before really like the emergence of all of this. Um, but still while it was being developed and it was informing a lot of these programs. Um, and so Grammarly, I, I used kind of the basic model. There's an advanced model where it can um, 
you know, offer you more suggestions about revisions for clarity and conciseness and that kind of stuff. The model I used was basically just kind of like a, an advanced, um, you know, word check that you would have in like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Um, but eventually Grammarly introduced something called Grammarly Go, which can like automatically draft things for you. They have like over a hundred different options where it can be like, you know, write me a cover letter or write me, you know, an email. A lot of the kind of the technical writing things you think of where it's like really rote genre work. Um, it kind of has automatically updated that. So that first came up to me as like something, you know, they sent an email, they're like, we're announcing this new thing. Um, and that kind of led my way into discovering about like chat GPT and some of the more like really popular uh, AI things. Um, I think something that I'm thinking about as a student and a teacher is that um, AI like tools are not separate from the rest of the internet, right? They, they're embedded in everything we do now. Um, so I think even things as something as simple as Microsoft Word spell check, right? Now it's because Microsoft owns, uh, you know, Bing and all this stuff, right? They have, they have lots of databases and that kind of thing, right? So even something that we think of as not AI, right? Something like spell check where it's like, oh, it's just checking for my commas in my, you know, in my paper, right? It's, it's being informed by these large language models now. Um, and so that's something I've been thinking about as a writer, um, and also as a teacher and a, and a curriculum developer. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of us who are like, want to learn more about AI are concerned about it and want to do something about it and talk about it with our students. I think that's something that a lot of us miss is that we think AI is very discreet from everything else that students do online. Um, and often students are using it without realizing that they're building off of, right, what AI has kind of developed already. Um, so things like Google Bard, for example, that's like an explicit AI tool, but the searches that go into Google Bard are informing Google search. So if we even use Google search, right, the things we're using in Google search are informed by things that are done through Google Bard, right? Um, so that's just like something to kind of keep in mind as we're talking through all this stuff. I think that's a common misconception that a lot of us, even though we want to, you know, be really good and, and smart about this, um, and we want to maybe avoid using AI for certain reasons, right? It's kind of hard to avoid at this point. So it's something that as a teacher and as a, as a curriculum developer, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, something I've been thinking about and I've been implementing with my students online this semester. I teach a writing course that's online. It's eight weeks this semester. Um, it's for students who need to pass first year writing for like seniors. And for whatever reason, they just didn't do it um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, and so I haven't done anything in terms of AI with drafting or um, like developing ideas yet. Um, I haven't practiced that in the classroom, but I've done stuff with revision of work with AI tools. Um, and I've been trying to do a lot of reflective writing with them thinking about why or why not they're choosing to accept the changes that AI is suggesting to them, um, right? So, so I think especially for seniors, um, and I have some juniors too, that's a little easier of an ask than say like a freshman where they're still kind of developing the idea of reflective writing. Um, but a lot of what I'm trying to instill in my uh, students especially because they're working on genre projects, we call them basically. So it's like they're writing a, a writer's memo and an infographic about a research tool, uh, about a research topic, right? So like um, when I have them look at their writer's memo and then they revise it, I say like, okay, think about what is required of this writer's memo. Like what is the assignment asking you to do? What's the genre of a writer's memo? And then think about what these tools are suggesting you change about it. Is it in line with what this genre actually is? Right? Is this something that is taking away your voice, right? I want to hear your voice when you're reflecting on like, this was my research process. This is what I, you know, as a student, I'm thinking about this research topic now that I've done this research process. Um, and so with these tools that offer like really more thorough revision, like Grammarly Go, like ChatGPT, that kind of stuff. Um, I've been trying to be, have help students, even if like in the moment, they're not necessarily being like the most awesome reflective people ever, it still signals to them that this is something to be reflective about, right? Um, and that's really how I'm trying to think about this as a teacher is like, I'm not gonna fix everyone's attitudes about AI to my specific right ideology about what AI is and what, how, what the right way, ethical way to use it is, but I'm really trying to instill in students that these are questions to be asked about what they're using. Um, so I'm, I'm developing next semester, um, I'm helping to develop some curriculum to revise the, the very first writing course that students take here, which is English 101. Um, and we're trying to do a lot more now on the front end of like 
coming up with ideas and see, assessing whether or not AI is like actually helpful with them, like understanding complexity within these ideas. Um, because I think a lot of students like will just see it and be like, oh, because this thing says X, Y, and Z, right? It's from a reputable source to them, right? Like Google Bar or ChatGPT is a reputable source in their eyes, a lot of students. Um, so it's getting them to really think about like, at what stage of the writing process am I? And is this tool actually something that's helpful for me and why? Um, I think a lot of our students, um, myself included, I don't know everything about AI. I know how to use it though, right? And so I think like, um, especially for our, us in the first year writing program, we wanna be really explicit with what these things are for students because we are so focused on writing and it's becoming a big thing with writing. Um, and so like helping them understand what a large language model is how it's being informed, how it's informing a lot of the other tools they might use. Um, and that kind of stuff I think is really important. In terms of student uses I've seen, I've talked, uh, I've talked to a couple of my undergraduate students um, who I've like seen use AI on assignments where it's again, that more like reflective piece of like, you know, what did you think about this reading or things like that, right? And I can tell it's kind of developed through AI um, because it's generic, you know, it's not fully, you know, I'm like, you need to have a page number, right? Or I teach a, I teach a course um, a, of intro to film and television. And right? I'm like, you need to have a timestamp here. There's no timestamp here. It's obvious, like you haven't watched the TV show or whatever, right? It's kind of generic. Um, and then a student will disclose me. They're like, yeah, I used AI because like I was running late and blah, blah, blah. And, and so uh, like those are kind of instances where I try to reiterate of like, I want to see who you are as a student, who you are as a writer rather than AI. Um, and in those moments, I think rather than being like combative and like punitive about it, I think it's a little more generative to like help the student see that like I actually care about what they're thinking. Um, so, so in terms of AI uses that my students have done, I think it's a lot less um, thoughtful and thorough than I hope. And so as I'm developing ideas about curriculum assignments and things, I'm trying to kind of embed this idea in students that this is a tool you can use, but you want to be thoughtful about how you use it. Um, yeah, stop there. Thank you very much, David. Yeah. Appreciate that. And we'll have some more time for questions as well. Mm -hmm. But first, we have our last presenter of today. Uh, that is David Gouch, uh, who will be joining us online. David, are you? Ben. 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 <laughs> that's my, that's my dad's <laughs> name. It's the end of the semester. Oh, exactly. <laughs> my dad's name is David, so don't, <laughs> not, I'm not him. Um. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Gouch. Um, I'm a third year uh, PhD student in the urban ed program. Um, right now, I echo kind of how everybody has talked, especially the doctoral students or dissertators have talked about it, <laughs> especially Danielle. I've been burned by fake made up citations. So I kind of... Um, I'm, oh, I should mention, I'm very much still in the information gathering phase. Um, I'm getting ready to put together my proposal soon. So still doing like lit review stuff and still expanding. So AI is really helpful for that right now. Um, and kind of the way I got around uh, kind of getting these citations that lead to nowhere is I just started acting asking um, about authorship. So... Um, let me find one example. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yesterday I actually, I found an article, uh, it was about, uh, using data mining in, uh, LMS learning analytics, which is where my research is located, how LMSs are used in face-to-face -face traditional classroom environments and stuff like that. But I hadn't really done anything with data mining, educational data mining before. So I just grabbed all the citations from it and threw it in here and I asked it um, to kind of just summarize what they were about or if they're re uh, what they're related to. And then after that, I asked it, what are the key authors in the field? And it produced a list of these authors. And then I went back and I asked it, I said, are any of these authors in the citations I provided? And then from there, I found these four and then I went to those four articles and then I kind of like branched out through that way. And then I once I got to those four key contributors, then I manually just citation surfed them with my own eyes. I didn't use AI for it. So that's one way that I've um, 
gotten like GPT to give me the suggestions, but not really like um, trusting them like right off the bat. So then I'll kind of go verify for themselves through UWM library, search at UW, things like that. Um, today or yesterday, I just asked it, uh, I had an old title of what my project is and I gave it to it. And then I asked it um, what it thought about it. And it was uh i had acronyms in there so it was like you know what is that i don't know what that is so i defined the acronym then it gave me a revised title which i actually kind of liked um more than what that one used to be and then i asked it again just for the hell of it i said well, you know what are the major authors related to this and then i followed these people because it usually I, I haven't been burned yet by a fake person uh i've always been able to find the um the author but I think sometimes with um, the hallucinating, maybe it, it merges different paper topics and things like that together, uh, especially if you're asking it for like two different things. It might make it one paper where you, it's like a holy grail paper. If you look at it, you're like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I needed. And then you go and then it doesn't exist. Um, and then I, I also use it to. um summarize like findings of papers so i just i'll just like if there's a huge like results section that has all the themes i'll then start talking with ben you're breaking up a bit i'm breaking up. can i have you cut, cut video for you or could you cut video oh mm, sure and you can share there you go can you hear me better now yes yeah okay cool um yeah so I'll, I'll um i'll have it use um break down themes for me uh, um the findings of papers um especially papers that i know i'm not gonna that i don't think are that re relevant um but maybe there's a couple keywords instead of me reading it first i'll just kind of throw um a lot of the theme data into it and see if it can if, if it summarizes things in bullet points and usually you have to ask it for bullet points too um but yeah these are some of the ways that i'm um kind of cutting time on information searching and seeking which um is definitely helpful when you're in this kind of stage that i'm in right now where you're just kind of reaching at everything So yeah, that's kind of some of the ways I use it. I use it like a like a research assistant, an unpaid, unpaid research assistant. Thank you very much, Ben. Well, thank you all of our presenters as well. I really appreciate you being able to come in at such last minute and share such really interesting things that I haven't really thought of using a lot of this. So that's really amazing. But I wanted to open it up for questions as well. So please, um, if you have questions online, I'm going to go and uh, <laughs> monitor that as well. But anybody here as well, please. Uh, and I had a question for Ali. You mentioned that you use um, generative AI for like proofreading and things. What is like, what's your workflow when you're using it like that? So I will paste something I've read into chat GBT or some other AI tool. I use chat GBT most. And I have it read it to me. Okay. Or I ask it, does this sound concise? Does it flow well? And I ask about sentence structure mostly. And do you get like reasonable, useful feedback from it? Okay. Interesting. Thank you. I do the same, especially because like I know just from like writing so much, I know I really tend to have long, lots of commas, <laughs> right? Long sentences. So like especially with clarity and conciseness, I think yeah. that's really helpful. But I don't know about you, but like I never like just copy and paste what it gives me and then replace it. Yeah. Right? I always think like, oh, I like what they did with this sentence, but this sentence I'm going to keep it the way I like it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good for um, asking for tone. Like I'll paste something I write in and ask for the tone of it. And then I'll tell it what I, what I think the tone was supposed to be. And then it'll rewrite it in the tone like that I ask it to. And then, uh, like David said, I, I don't... Um, I'm obviously not copying and pasting it back, but I have found like a lot of good um, like synonyms and stuff for words that um, 
maybe I've been re uh, using too much too often. Um, and it'll suggest like new, um, like a new way or a new sentence structuration of it. That is what I wrote. It's the same idea, but sometimes maybe you just need to, you know, swap two sentences around or change a word here and there. And I think it's really good at doing that. And other tools, I was going to this like other tools like Grammarly Go. Um, there's another one called WordTune has similar tools where it'll, where it'll like analyze the tone and kind of tell you. And I know at least Grammarly Go, it's not just like a spectrum of like formal to informal. It's like, this is the kind of formality. This is the kind of audience. This is the kind of whatever else. There's like three different kind of sliders that they give you. So it gives you more detailed info than I would expect. I have been noticing as well, just to just to piggyback, just I lately I've been asking it, like getting me editing suggestions, and then it gives me bolted like kind of like like an like a like an English. If I had an English instructor looking at my paper and then gave me suggestions, and then it gave me the new paragraph. But then I was like, oh, I'd go through. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I remember that seventh grade English class. I should definitely do that more. And like, and so it's just really good suggestions on how to take my my writing and make it better. Um, was there another question? Yes, or. Oh, Sarah. I'm curious. So you said you have it read it to you. Do you have it read it to you aloud? Like I always ask my students to read their paper out loud to somebody else because that's how they hear where the changes are. Or do you have it read it and it just gives you like read it on the screen it to itself and it gives you suggestions? I have it read it out loud because then I can hear if I need a comma there, if it doesn't sound right. And I use that if my sister is available to read it to me or my mom is available to read it to me. Right, right. What kind of voice is it? Is it like a Stephen Hawking's, like it's very monotone type of thing? It's so much more you use. It's not different from generator to generator. Have you used Speechify before? Speechify is like an extension that does something similar to you, but it can be like anything on the screen. Oh, interesting. Very cool. But I see this as being like an equalizer for there are students that have family members that would listen to them read that paper. And there are students that they're first gen, nobody else in their family is, knows anything about this. And so what a way to level the playing field for those students and help them get the same resources that other students are already have, right? That's really cool. Do you remember in the, the class last spring, one, one of the students was like, I was asking, oh, do you have people editing your papers? And she was like, oh yeah, I have 20 people, I have a team of 20 people that will you know take a look. So like, wow, that's amazing. But this is another, this is a way of, Loving yeah. that painting field. Yeah. So, yeah. yes. I, actually, I have a, like, first, I just want to thank all of you. These are really helpful things to hear. Hearing about your work in the curriculum development is really fascinating. Um, hearing about how you're doing these different things, Ali, is really good. Um, so, my comment is for Danielle. Danielle, your story about the Christmas tree thing, I think you want to take this and write a story and you submit it to McSweeney's. It's hysterical. <laughs> um, I think that would be, and then, you know, I don't know. There's a lot to be done with it. So, um, okay. And it's funny and be like it when you found that. Um, and then my question was, um, oh David, the question is actually, I feel like I had a question for Ben, but the question I'm remembering now, David, is for you, yeah. which is you're seeing what are you hearing from students about when they choose to use what the, the suggestions given to them versus when they don't? Like how are they thinking about it? And then like how are you trying to get them to think Yeah, about it I think differently because sometimes. this is my first semester trying it, right? It's a lot yeah, of I know, I, know it's, I know it's very <laughs> preliminary, but yeah. I'm just so curious. Yeah, but. yeah. I think especially because um, this is an online course, uh, kind of typical of an online course, I kind of have like half the students like submitting everything on time, mm -hmm. right? It's a couple, a couple of stragglers. But the students that are submitting things on time are, are talking, they're talking about how, especially for this last project that it's, so they, so in, in 102, they do for their, First project, but like they do all their research, then they create the infographic about the topic, something about Milwaukee. So, like for example, one student like created an infographic about how to like about the rat problem in Milwaukee and how to like guard your cows from rats, that kind of stuff. She wrote a writer's memo about it, right? Um, and then I provided some feedback, and I was like, oh, like you know, in your writer's memo, I didn't really see like direct you know citations or things like that. So then she ran it through the AI stuff. Um, and because part of the prompt for the writer's memo was like, what specific parts of the infographic did you choose that was appropriate for this topic, right? So like the color, right? The font, that kind of stuff, right? She didn't have that in her writer's memo. So I'm like, you know, I'm gonna mark this as incomplete. I do complete and complete in the course because like, I wanna really see that, you know? Um, and I said like, part of how to do this, you could run through an AI um, thing. And I like gave her like an extension question like on the writer's memo of like, I ran this through AI, here's the feedback it gave me. Um, 
for that student, um, she responded and said like the AI, like because it can't see my infographic, um, right? It can't really give me specific advice, but in the advice it gave me about the paragraph, it said something really similar to what you said, where like it couldn't, it, it couldn't find any specific examples, right? So that alerted to me as a writer that I needed to put those in there. Um, I would say that's the ideal student, right? right. Is, is that kind of thing, right? Um, I have a lot of other students who are just like, oh yeah, it said, you know, I should, you know, I checked and I had some missing periods. So like I put those in, right? A lot of it, it's more kind of the, the surface level kind of stuff, yeah. right? Um, I think because it's an online course, I'm not with them in person that mm -hmm. prohibits some of that interactive stuff, right? Like we would do like a peer review in class, right? We do that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which also kind of helps with some of that reflective stuff. Um, Next semester, I'm teaching an in-person course. Um, it's a senior level course. It's a, it's a 600 level course. Um, and we're gonna, it's a digital arts and design course. It's kind of all about, um, the first half is all about AI and how it's impacting the design, digital design field. Um, so that's gonna be a lot more intensive stuff. I'm, ex I'm really excited to try out some more of that stuff like in class assignments where it's like, all right, everybody like go and plug this in here and let's talk about it in small groups, let's report out to the large group, let's put our findings up on the board, right? I, I, got, I wanna turn that stuff more into like in-person activities because I think that's a lot more generative to hear what other students are doing, mm -hmm. right? To kind of come up and see like, here's some common trends of like, you know, this was the stuff that did really well. This is the stuff where I really see it kind of like taking away what I meant, right? Um, we can be a little more thorough with that kind of stuff when it's in person. Um, so right now I'm really triaging, right? Yeah, yeah. So I want to add to that. I was speaking to a classmate in one of my graduate level psychology courses this morning, and she said her one of her other professors will put a question about what they're learning in ChatGPT mm -hmm. and pull up a summary that it provides, mm -hmm. and then they go through as a class at the beginning of class and dissect it. Um, what was talked about in lecture, what was talked about in the textbook, what wasn't covered by AI, mm -hmm. and how useful is this summary? Yeah, that, that's exactly like one of the things we're doing with like the beginning stages of the writing process for the writing course in the fall um, is like we're, we're designing activities where it'll be like, all right, we use things like ethos, pathos, and logos, for example, right? And I think no matter what course you teach, um, Right, the definitions you use in your class isn't the same as the textbook definitions, right? So, so we're designing activities where they like go in in small groups, they like, plug in, like, you know, describe what ethos is to me, like I'm a first year writing student, um, right? And then it'll be like, okay, so here's like kind of the textbook definition. How is that different from what we're talking about in class, right? I think that also helps students like start to, the wheels start to turn a little bit that like it's the same word, but how we're using it is different. So I wanted to get a couple items from the chat. Um, uh, yeah, Eddie uh, is mentioning, and I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, just to, I asked if anybody's familiar with um, SciSpace Copilot. It's an assistant AI tool uh, for lit reviews. So that's something to check out as well. And I can put these in lab notes as well later on. Um, I wanted to also... Uh, point out, all right, she had another question as well. Grammarly Go seems to be adopted by some universities. I don't know if anybody here knows this answer, maybe David. Um, does UWM have an account for students and faculty? Um, and so, cause it has a, it's indicated that Grammarly is uh, education, is available with education wide licenses. Do we have anything like that? So it's something you have to probably pay on your own. Yeah. Uh, to use then. All right. You could ask one of the librarians at the research help desk or just the help desk and they would be able to have a better answer for you too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, they're, they're, so I'm from the library. I don't know if we do. Okay. At this point, we're following this very, very closely in particular in terms of how it intersects with research. I've, you know, just this semester, I've had a couple faculty just go two different directions mm -hmm. with chat GPT. One's like, I'm not assigning any small papers anymore because People aren't writing them themselves um, to faculty that have been like really embracing it in terms of. So we're on both sort of sections um, in terms of whether or not campus would purchase. That's a CTS question. So let's see. Uh -huh. Someone needs to put in a software request for it. <laughs> the faculty people, not the librarians, the faculty people need to make a case that we need this, not awesome. us. But that's how we would close the loop for you. Yeah. Thank you. For I that. wonder, I wonder just as a writing instructor, like yeah. for those professors that are saying like no small writing assignments, are they going to like in person writing? Are they doing like classic blue books in class kind of essays? For this particular professor, I actually went totally old school, did a handout. I mean, I've been a librarian for a long time. You, here's your handout. 
you know, here's your, you know, um, the, so yeah, so here's my topic. Here's what I found. Here's some of like the research things I'm gesturing to people who are online. Here's some of how like the research process. So describe your research process. So that type of thing. So again, for us, really no judgment, just in terms of how you want to handle it. We will facilitate that for you. Um, library databases are starting to, so like the big EBSCO, um, ProQuest and things like that are starting to sort of say, you know what, we're adding these AI tools on ourselves. Um, so I will be the first person to say like, yeah, the databases are difficult to use. They're all difficult to use, you know, again, for really a lot of in-depth research, there can be some challenges. And so it'll be interesting to see how things change or how they're, um, uh, how transparent they are with terms of how AI is helping maybe their resources be more effective, which we're excited about as, you know, librarians. But we've been following this um, and hope to kind of generate something um, that is really like forward facing to faculty in terms of like, these are the tools, these are, you know, how they could potentially be used, that type of thing, um, like through one of our, our um, libguides. Thank you. One more question from online. Um, in talking about AI really getting smart, Doris's iPad um, is asking us a question. <laughs> um, and uh, she asks, Ben, can you please repeat how you use AI for your results section? Um, he, she said, just couldn't hear you at that uh, at that moment. So Ben, could you just go back oh, one more time? Sure. Yep. Yeah, so I'll <clears throat> I'll take the results of a paper and then I'll plug it into GPT and then I'll ask it to summarize those results. And um, for that particular paper that I was sharing, if it had five themes and from uh, theme four was like teaching models and methods. And it was talking about flipped classrooms and what, what that means to the learning management system. So then I asked it, you know, and then I saw, then I started talking to it about that theme and I was like, you know, what are the benefits of a flipped classroom approach in higher education? And it came back with like 10 bullet points on um, like accessibility and flexibility, improved student prep, um, personalized learning, um, more effective uses of class time. So then I talked with it again, and then I asked it again. I said, who are the major contributors to flipped classroom research in higher ed? And it gave me like eight names, I think. And then I started talking to it again about like citation. Um, so then I plugged citations into it and, you know, asked it what um, are any of those authors represented in this citations list? And so, yeah, it, it's a it's a good way to um, this particular study wasn't that uh, was qualitative, so it wasn't that crazy. But sometimes when you're trying to sort through like quantitative results that are always confusing, because maybe I didn't pay as much attention in quantitative methods as I should have. Um, uh, it, it can it's really good at um, kind of extracting information related to like statistics and things like that as well. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for the question uh, as well, Doris. Uh, uh, Danielle, you had a uh, you, had one, you had your hand raised. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, pop in and say like something that one thing that was interesting. So I do research. I'm writing a novel, but I also do scholarly research in women's and gender studies, and I'm interested in um, like experiences of miscarriage and um, like reproductive loss and the whole continuum of conversation around kind of. Um, that area. And so one thing that was interesting, like that's where I was really kind of doing this back and forth. And this was like early on in my kind of putzing, honestly, which I guess was semi-research um, with generative AI. And so um, what I was trying to sort of trying to like hone my, actually, you know, what I, I guess I thought I was trying to hone my literary, my lit review, but I think I was really trying to help myself, like use it as a tool to set a research agenda and prioritize my time. Um, and figure out like, how do I tackle this? Like if I had uh, years, I would read like, you know, 60 books, but I have like three months. And so how do I gain some expertise in this and um, in a strategic way? And one thing that I noticed is I had to be very careful and kind of um, prompt, be careful in my prompts in um, how I was asking for sources in ways that return sources from black feminists and black feminist thought. Um, and like big people like Patricia Hill Collins, Bell Hooks, if any of those names are familiar, who have totally written in response to the sort of like maternal feminisms that I was looking into. 
Um, and so I don't have like a real thesis on that, except for that, like, I appreciate the habits of mind <laughs> that feminist theory and that humanities has given me to kind of ask, be always asking questions about um, like gaps in research, archival silences, um, ways that like our citational practices can um, perform erasures or be harmful. And so like something I'm deaf, if I was now starting my PhD, I might be asking in and like kind of cooking up a paper or something like about how AI is either generative AI, I should say like some, like a chatbot is specifically like, how is it replicating or resisting or maybe complicating um, these sort of like archival silences or citational gaps? Um, and then how do we respond? And, but the thing is that like, that's not a new question <laughs> that came up with like researching in tandem with generative AI. Like that's a question that um, like I talk about and I hear people talk about at conferences and in classes and in kind of critical conversations all the time. So something I'm always thinking about is like, <clears throat> you know, sometimes I think it can be easy when you're using a new tool. Um, like I appreciate what you said, David, about how like we all use AI all the time <laughs> um, and we have for many years and it's integrated and embedded in many of our like daily practices. And it's good to recognize that um, just like how we're always trying to tell our students, you use rhetoric and writing all the time. Um, <laughs> but also I think, um, yeah, it's a tool that I think like it's kind of easy to have that whiplash feeling of like, wow, the boogie monster is out and now um, like it's doing things that we're completely unprepared for. Honestly, I think there are probably ways that, that that is true, but not in that like broad brush, we've never seen this before kind of like alarmism. Um, like I think that they're like, I feel like the humanities actually has a ton of tools for asking questions about um, AI and like researching it in a scholarly way. Um, that I'm interested in. So yeah, I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Any other questions? I actually have a follow-up for what Danielle was just saying here. Danielle, when you were saying that you were you were using it in your research and that you said something about how it was or wasn't pulling up Black feminists, could you talk more about what you asked it and what it gave you and what it didn't give you and what you realized at that time? Yeah, I think I forget. I should have had the exact prompts pulled up, and I don't. Oh, um, no. But I, but basically, I was kind of like I had a burgeoning list of people who I felt like were important. Like mm -hmm. you know, trying trying to create that citational lineage of people who had spoken on the field or spoken on this question and that needed to be in a literature review. Um, and initially, it was giving me. I, I started with Adrian Rich, who's a white feminist, and um, initially, it was kind of omitting um some like black feminist theorists who I would have expected to be there um but then but like that was also the way I was asking the question and when I adjusted um and when I asked specifically about certain things that I had background knowledge about then it did kind of like self-correct um but it was interesting to observe that and I that's not something I would have even known to observe if I hadn't already read like multiple uh, edited collections. <laughs> about, really, thanks so much. Yeah. 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 Sarah. So, yeah. So I love that because it speaks so much to the importance of what we do as educators here in helping our students know what to look for, right? Like if you don't know what you don't know and you go looking, you can't find the things that you really need to know. But I did have a question and this is kind of across the board. Um, in the classes where you are allowed to use AI or you allow your students to use AI, do you feel, um, and I know it's anecdotal, that there it, that just open acknowledgement of it is a tool and here's how we use it and here's how we're going to use it and how it's good, that that, that conversation reduces cheating? Did, I mean, did you, did you have people passing off drafts before you used AI and, and like how how is that working in your experiences? Well, I know in the psychology department, a lot of their test questions come directly word for word off Quizlet or word for word out of an AI model. model. So are they cheating on writing their exams as well? <laughs> That's my function for them. Because if they're not writing their exams and they're pulling all of their questions off Quizlet, which you have to face questions in a psych exam, all of them are all the same. Interesting. So 
I, I would say, I think that points to um, the role of the instructor and in all this, right? And being really deliberate with how you're designing your course. Um, really knowing what kind of writing you want to get, for, like you want your students to practice and, and go through and really understanding how that lines up with, or like, you know, is harder to do for X, right? So like, so like, I think it all depends on the course you're teaching and what kind of writing you're doing, right? Because like, say you like want to do, so you're teaching like a foreign language course, right? Like this, the, what you're asking your students to do if they're writing stuff is going to be vastly different from what you're doing for a psych exam, right? And I think, I think students, at least in my experience, students have appreciated that because it makes them see me as an instructor who like kind of knows what's going on a little bit. Um, and, and when I have talked with students about, like, I don't even really approach students as like, this was AI made. I'm like, this is really generic and I can't see your learning in this. I think that then in my experience, and also I, I mentor some, some new teachers in the writing program and their experience when they go to students and say, say like, this, I don't really see your thinking here. Like the students, I think because they're freshmen are like, I'm so sorry I used AI. <laughs> right? um, I think like depending on what kind of classes you teach, it's gonna be a little different. But but I think in general, I think having the conversation and like saying like, this is generally kind of some good ways of saying of using it, this is generally some bad ways of using it, I think is, is beneficial for your students. Danielle or Ben? I can pop in. Um, I think, I don't know in my classes I teach if I am, I, you know, I, I allow students to use AI. I ask them to cite it. I stole that or borrowed that. <laughs> uh, was got in from, I think, Seidel. Um, I sometimes do say, like, I think it would be helpful to not use AI on this discrete task. But I think something, I don't know if it's changing the work they're doing or the way they're engaging. But I do think that just like anything, like, at engaging with it means that there's an opportunity for learning and and metacognitive reflection about how they write best or how they learn best. And so I think if I don't address it, it makes it sort of this like prohibit, pro prohibitive thing that we can't discuss, but just like anything in a writing process or in a learning process, I think at least asking them like, how did this help your pro like asking them to engage those questions opens up the opportunities for reflection on what was happening there. Um, and I see it in my own classes. I'm taking an advanced class right now, and the instructor said, like, or the professor said, you, you can, everybody learns and writes and works in different ways. And so use AI if you want. It's just another tool. Um, and actually, that's been interesting because then something that maybe I would have been hush hush and silent about and felt like I was like cheating or something like that um, is instead like opened up as a topic of conversation. And then we can say like, okay, how do we use our lenses from feminist theory, for example, to ask questions about AI? So I think it just is like a, a pathway for learning, but I'm not really sure. I think it was fruitful to talk about it and to not pretend it doesn't exist. And I don't really know if it was like an upswing in, I don't know how much they were doing their drafting without using AI. I don't know. Ben, did you want to get the last word in? Yeah, sure. Um, Sarah mentioned earlier that uh, with the readback thing about how much of a how much it levels the playing field, especially for first generation students. I approach it from that perspective that it's no it's like telling your students they can't use the Internet to do something at this point. I mean, I know we're not as as evolved and as comfortable with it, but with how available it is and how with how many people are using it and using it in all these innovative ways, I think when you like stifle that it it's not good for um anybody because you're gonna get like what danielle said feeling kind of crummy about yourself because you feel like you're maybe not um maybe you're subverting the prompt or something like that because you're using it to help you uh so i think we have to embrace it you have to model it um i teach freshmen in uh edsci 101 which is a five-week um foundations of success in higher ed and i asked them about how they're using AI, if their teachers are using AI in their other courses, things like that. And then we, you know, I'll open it up and we'll, we'll use it together. So I think you have to model it with them and, and show it, show the, the bad ways you can use it, show all the good ways and the beneficial ways they can help them. And as long as we're doing that, I think in being transparent about it, then kind of the sky's the limit on it, but definitely telling people not to do it is going to make them use it more. <laughs> Blanket rejection just doesn't tell your students anything. 
about how it is, how you want, how they should write in your classroom. Right?